You know, there's a lot of uh, groups out there and individuals out there who say the Bible is our sole source of authority, but we end up then saying, uh, well, I know the Bible says that, but, and we're very subtle about it, but we need to make sure that the Bible actually says what we're teaching and what our doctrine is. So uh, let's take the word today as we uh, come into the word and uh, always uh, happy to have your questions, those of you who are logged on live and uh, look forward to hearing from you on that. And uh, just a few words of announcements before we get into our Q&A time today. And uh, that is, of course, we've been teaching the Book of Romans on Wednesday nights at 615 Mountain Time. would love to have you join us right here at youtube.com slash Randy White or randywhiteministries.org. Click that live stream button, uh, live broadcast button, and you'll find it. And Thursday nights, we're in the Book of Daniel. Now we come, I believe we've had 18 sessions in the Book of Daniel. We come into the 19th this week. And we're in chapter 12, which is the final chapter in the book of Daniel. And uh, it is an exciting chapter as it definitely talks about things yet future and things that are very exciting as it relates to uh, the world, the Gentile reign and the Jewish remnant and what God is going to do in the future. That's Thursday night, 7 p.m. Mountain Time and would love to see you. Uh, for that, and uh, it uh, will be a blessing. Let me take a question that came in uh, uh, concerning Daniel, came in previously, and the question is from uh, Bob in Washington, who says, Daniel, uh, in, in chapter 8, verse 11, uh, speaks about the little horn. Is it possible that the ending of the sacrifice and the destruction of the temple could refer to the destruction by the Romans in 70 AD? This is Daniel chapter 8, verse 11. And... Uh, if we were to uh, look at Daniel chapter 8, uh, verse 11, it says, Yea, he magnified himself even to the prince of the host. And by him the daily sacrifice was taken away, and the place of his sanctuary was cast down. Now, Bob's question is, could that be about 70 A.D. Uh, in the year, which of course was the year of the destruction of the temple by the Romans? Now, honestly, as I uh, look at this, I would have to say that uh, I don't think that uh, you can go there. And uh, there's a, a couple of reasons. One, when you take Daniel chapter 11, it is certainly talking about a, a Greek king uh, and the work that that Greek or Seleucid king is carrying out. And I th think uh, both in Daniel chapter 8 and in Daniel chapter 11 and in Daniel chapter 8 verse 11, what you have, the context is uh, the coming Greek king who will again, uh, uh, remove the daily sacrifice and the place of his sanctuary cast down. Now, that really uh, very closely describes what Antiochus IV Epiphanes did uh, in about 163 BC. But I think that's not only the intermediate. I think it uh, ultimately speaks about what the Antichrist is going to do. Now, the, uh, uh, I think that uh, perhaps you could, as you looked through this, say, well, in 70 AD, the daily sacrifice was taken away and the place of the sanctuary was cast down. No doubt about it, they were. And yet I think the rest of the context does not fit for 70 AD. So uh, the, the probably, my guess is, and I haven't read a, one of these, but my guess is the preterist interpretation would be that all this took place either with Antiochus Epiphanes or in 70 AD, intermediate and and ultimate uh, in 70 AD. I just think there's too much in the rest of the context that doesn't fit 70 AD. So I would uh, honestly uh, put that thought aside in terms of 70 AD. Now it's worth questioning the assumptions and worth uh, digging into there uh, just a, a little bit more. Louise comes with a, a question that came in in advance as, uh, as well. Uh, she said, can you express your opinion on suicide? Is it a sin and is it a sin that uh, will bar the person from heaven? I heard someone ask this question on a radio program. I'm curious as to what you think. Thank you, Louise. Uh, suicide, one of the most difficult issues in society, of course, in a family, of course. It breaks apart a family oh, and, and causes grief, unlike like any other kind of death. It is uh, tremendously painful. And uh, probably every one of us knows someone who has committed suicide or attempted to commit suicide because it is unfortunately very prevalent in our society. One of the things I think is we really ought to uh, learn a kindness sort towards people, uh, people that have done wrong, people that uh, have uh, been caught in something, people that uh, are, are odd, 
perhaps, uh, people that disagree with us, let's make sure we, uh, we treat them in such a way that, uh, that we're an encouragement to them, even if we have a strong disagreement. And this is so hard for us to do, uh, to, uh, to, to treat someone with dignity and with respect, even when, uh, when, when they have uh, done something. And you know that often, not always, but often, uh, suicide comes after um, you know, some, some uh, horrible act or sin or tragedy that a person commits, and they just don't know how to handle it or don't want to face it. I think we ought to uh, help them with, with uh, love and dignity and respect. And, and then secondly, for most of us who know someone who committed suicide, we had no idea that they were going through some kind of a turmoil. So I think it's very important that we just uh, we, we learn to treat people kindly. That doesn't mean we just have to uh, throw everything under the rug, but there's a lot of stuff that just, you know, leave it under the rug. It doesn't have to be brought out, and we need to come with dignity. Now, that is not your question. The, the question is, uh, is suicide a sin is the first point of the question. And I would say, yes, it is a sin. It's a sin because God is the creator of life. And just like murder is a sin and abortion is a sin, uh, euthanasia, uh, excuse me, uh, uh, the, uh, um, the, the, the pogroms, uh, I'm having a hard time finding that word, uh, the, uh, that uh, 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 kills an ethnicity. There's a word for that. Someone will help me here. Uh, that's a sin. Any kind of removal of life is a sin because God is the author and sustainer of life. Life is something we put over into his hands and allow him to do that. So suicide, uh, just like homicide uh, is, uh, is a sin. Now the question is, is it a sin that bars a person from heaven? Now what I would have you do is uh, look at the issue of of grace, actually, because grace uh, covers, sometimes we sing a song about marvelous, matchless, infinite grace, grace that exceeds my sin and my guilt, grace that is amazing, grace that covers all sin. And this is uh, what the grace of Jesus Christ does when Christ took his, uh, uh, took sin upon the cross, he took all of it, uh, even suicide. So, uh, suicide is not an unforgivable sin. And if a person has accepted G the gift of Jesus Christ, uh, the gift that God gives of eternal life by grace through faith in Jesus Christ, if God, if a person has accepted that, then they can go, for example, to uh, Romans chapter 8 that says, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. No condemnation, even for suicide. So does it bar a person from heaven? No, it does not if that person has accepted Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. There's only one thing that bars a person from heaven, and that is a refusal or a lack of acceptance of the offer of Jesus Christ. To, to not place your faith in Jesus Christ will bar you from heaven. Nothing else will bar you from heaven. There's a lot of things we don't like. There's a lot of things we're concerned about. There's a lot of things that may even disgust us. There's a lot of things that hurt, but they don't bar us from heaven. Now, the one uh, uh, example in which uh, you you might argue with me on this, is if a person has not accepted Jesus Christ as their Savior and they're successfully, uh, successful at committing suicide, then there's, there's not a second chance. There's no way they can do that after that point. So, so important that uh, we help a person who is uh, considering suicide or we think they might be suicidal or they, uh, uh, or, or they seem to be in a depression or they seem to be a loner uh, or they're, they're faced with a crisis. Let's hold their hand and walk them through there and uh, guide them because uh, they really can uh, make, it, uh, make, it, make it through uh, a very dark night and a very difficult battle. And sometimes it's just so hard to think you're ever going to get out of this that suicide seems to be a viable option. It's not a viable option. And uh, even for the person who's saved, it's not a viable option. Our desire is uh, to, to live for Christ, to honor him in all that we do. So does it affect rewards? Certainly it does. It affects rewards. Does it affect our obedience? Certainly. Does it affect our witness? Certainly it does. And uh, these are things I think that we have to 
uh, look into and uh, carry that out. Genocide is the word I was looking for in addition to uh, suicide and homicide. Uh, genocide is the, uh, the killing of a race. Any of those sides, uh, the, uh, the, any, any kind of taking of life is a, is a matter of uh, murder. Thank you, uh, Michael, for helping me out with that word there that uh, slips sometimes. Well, I want us to go to our Alex Nitzberg commentary. I'll be back for more questions right after this, but a very interesting uh, uh, conversation about what's happening on college campuses. Go ahead and put your questions in the chat box as we uh, go to uh, Alex Nitzberg. Appreciate his young and bright mind. He's got a great show going, The Alex Nitzberg Show, and joins us here each uh, Tuesday. Let's turn to Alex. A recording from previously this morning. Alex Nitzberg, we are always glad to have you on Ask the Theologian. Welcome back on this Tuesday uh, from Florida, your vantage point there. You're reading a little bit about uh, the Hampshire College in Amherst, Massachusetts College, uh, which is far off the uh, left end, and yet they seem to be um, uh, plowing yet again some more uh, ground in the liberal arena. Tell us what you know, Alex. Thanks for having me back on, Dr. White. Yeah, Hampshire College is a, a lib it seems to be quite liberal and but pretty much everybody's cognizant of the fact that there's a lot of campus we call campus craziness going on at colleges where students are going to these schools and there's marinating in liberal ideology for years and so we know that a lot of colleges in america are bastions of liberalism but hampshire college uh, has something interesting going on so imagine combining identity politics social justice doctrine and the concept of safe spaces and what you're going to end up with is probably something like identity based housing, which is something that they're actually offering at Hampshire College and identity based housing is pretty much what it sounds like. It's segregated housing. Now it's self segregated housing because students choose that they want to live there, but it's basically there. There are there. I'm just going to read you. This is from the Hampshire College website. It says residence life and housing facilitates the continuation of many identity based housing communities started by students. These residential spaces give support to members of our community with social identities that have been historically marginalized in this country and strive to counter systemic oppression. This arises from our commitment to fostering diverse, socially just and inclusive communities. Then it goes on to say, we recognize that our society through its laws, institutional structures and customs has privileged some social groups while systematically disadvantaging and disenfranchising others. Even as we struggle to end these practices, we recognize that day-to-day -day life for members of these disadvantaged groups can be hurtful and exhausting. Now, let me explain to you specifically what I'm talking about. They have a list of permanent identity-based mods, not yet permanent identity-based mods. And so the permanent identity-based mods include one called LGBTQQIAAP. I'm assuming we can assume that that's LGBT type you know, people. Another one's called queer, so that's a separate one. There's another one called women of color, and then one called students of color and one called Asian heritage. And then the not yet permanent identity based mods, it listed pan African diaspora. That's one of them. And one called trans stability mod and one called uh, QPOC. And then there was one that said it was on hiatus for 2017 to 2018. And that was called the uh, marginalized gender identities. And so basically it's segregated housing is what it is, depending on what your identity is. And it's interesting because if you look at the guidelines for creating a new identity based mod at Hampshire College, um, guideline number two says, and I'm reading you a quote, it says the group must be unified by a social identity such as race, gender or sexual orientation. That's in parentheses. They're saying such as race, gender, or sexual orientation. And then in guideline number three says, quote, the unifying social identity must currently experience or has historically experienced oppression within or outside the Hampshire community. So it, this is just it, very interesting that this is going on at a college. And then uh, <clears throat> I assume, pardon me for interrupting a minute. I assume they're allowing these students to self-identify into these various um, mods, uh, housing modules uh, that they live in, like uh, uh, I like that one, the LGBTQQIAAP. They had to pay extra for a lengthy sign on that one. Uh, so these are self-identified kind of uh, living arrangements, correct? That could be assumed. Um, you know, the question that's interesting is like, what would happen if somebody who's white applied to the students of color one? And, um, you know, we don't really know. I, I talked on the phone to somebody because you know, I was trying to clarify some information when I was writing the article. And the person wouldn't answer that question. You know, what would happen if a white person applied to see the person I was speaking to didn't answer my question? They said they, they wouldn't answer it, basically. But it's an interesting question. What would happen? Um, 
but I'm assuming, yeah, because here's the thing with they have like all gender dorms and they have, um, you know, like uh, I think it said basically in the bathrooms at the all gender dorms or something like that. they were basically talking about bathrooms. And I think they said it was something about self-identified gender when they were talking about something about I saw something about gender. They're talking about self-identified gender. So you would assume basically. Yeah. Um, but so, OK, but the other thing they have here, they have something called intentional housing communities. Um, and those are, it says, living spaces in which the residents have chosen to come together around a particular area of interest uh, that will co contribute to and cultivate the campus's culture of learning. And so they have a, a bunch of different ones. Some of them were like, there was one called a basketball mod, the, the kosher mod, the STEM mod, which I'm assuming stands for science, technology, engineering, and math, uh, the mindfulness mod, the greenhouse mod, so stuff like that. But they had this one that stood out to me. It was called the gender justice mod, and it said formerly women's empowerment mod. And uh, they had this deluge of like leftist lingo in their description. And this is what it said. We understand our struggle against cis sexist heteropatriarchy as part of a broader struggle against all systems of domination, including but not limited to white supremacy, capitalism, imperialism and ableism. So that's like, you know, so that even in their intentional housing communities, they've got at least that sounds kind of nuts. <laughs> and then in 2015, yes. yeah, in 2015, um, the executive director of Accuracy in Academia, where I'm a contributing writer, Mal Klein, he, he wrote an article and he listed some of the college courses that they had uh, back then at this school. So I was like, oh, that's a good idea. I'll look and see what some of the upcoming courses are for the fall. And so <laughs> I look up the upcoming courses um, and here are some of the ones that I thought were particularly intriguing. They got a course called White Supremacy and Appropriate Whiteness in the Age of Trump. And then they had one called Border Matters, Mexico and the United States and one called Critical Ethnic Studies from Settler Colonialism to Trumpism. And then, of course, they've got all the weird feminist and gender studies courses, you know, like Queer Feelings, the Emotional and Effective Life of Gender, Sexuality and Race, Feminist, Queer and Trans Theories of Race. Now, that kind of stuff you'll find at a lot of colleges if you look at gender studies departments and women's studies departments. So here is a good one. They have a course called A Philosophy of Tattoos and Tattoo Art. And the description basically says they're looking at tattoos and, you know, if they're how they're a form of art, if they're a form of art and that kind of thing, and how it compares to visual art and that sort of stuff. So it's like, what are why are people paying to go to these classes? And not only that, but uh, I happened to go to their website and looked at the tuition and uh, for a year of uh, education at Hampshire College, uh, if you lived on campus and had their meal plan, I don't think you could do it for much less than $75,000. This is a, 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 the, the tuition alone for a year is over $50,000. And they're taking these classes like uh, uh, black girlhood studies uh, for $50,000 a year. I just don't understand uh, who's paying for this other than perhaps government uh, programs that are granting and these people are getting scholarships or they're just extreme uh, uh, liberal and also wealthy uh, people, uh, definitely uh, the one percenters, even if they're not paying it themselves, they're the one percenters because they are uh, getting this paid for by the government or by some granting institution or by mom and dad or whoever it is. And, and uh, you just, you, you wonder why would anyone pay $10 to take a class like white supremacy and appropriate whiteness in the age of Trump. What is appropriate whiteness anyway? Uh, and what is the age of Trump? And uh, on and on we could go on the uh, absolutely ridiculous things taking place at Hampshire College, where you too can get a uh, an education for uh, somewhere around half a million dollars, a stupid education that's not going to teach you facts. In fact, they, they go on and on uh, about on their website about how it's uh, they're into uh, experiences far more than they are facts. And that is uh, doesn't take very long to uh, get into there. I uh, just one more thing I'll uh, add on, let you give some closing comments, uh, Alex, but uh, I noticed uh, that uh, they are one of the highest uh, uh, institutions in America in terms of uh, their students going on to master's and doctorate degrees. And uh, I just think uh, very quickly on that, that's because their students don't know how to do anything. They couldn't make a living. They couldn't make it in the world. They have to continue education and then get into academia. And this is one of the problems in academia is that it becomes very uh, circular. It's just messed up all through. And Hampshire College is a great uh, illustration of that. Uh, thanks for making us aware of this. Alex, uh, any final word? 
Well, just that sadly, this is an example of a larger problem. I mean, we have multiple websites devoted to writing about liberal bias on college campuses. And the reason those websites are able to continue writing, you know, year after year after year is because this is a longstanding, uh, deep rooted problem. So this is one example, but there's so many other examples of this sort of thing. I mean, there's this entire conference called the MLA conference every year and accuracy in academia goes there and writes about it. And there's just craziness. I mean, <laughs> academia is very much uh, a mess. So. Uh, you're right. Academia is anemic uh, at best. And, um, uh, and, and sadly, this is uh, becoming more and more true, even in uh, Christian uh, colleges that uh, so many so-called Christian colleges are not biblical colleges. And so a, a parent really needs to do some uh, homework before they start uh, putting the money in there or a, uh, a young conservative student uh, as uh, they're making some educational decisions. Not an easy uh, thing to do in our world today. Alex Nitzberg, thanks for joining us again today. Thank you. And God bless you. Thank you, Alex. Uh, always uh, has an interesting topic for us to uh, think about, an interesting topic in the news. Fine young journalist, Alex Nitzberg. And uh, let's get back into our Ask the uh, Theologian questions now. Uh, and uh, before we do, let me just say at dispensationalpublishing.com, uh, all of our books, you can get them 20% off now through the end of the month. Just use the coupon code SAVE20, SAVE20, and uh, that'll cut 20% off whatever you've got in your cart uh, uh, for a little summer sale. Well, uh, Lynn gives a, a good question from Genesis chapter 6, verses 1 through 4. Uh, the question is, were the Nephilim already on the earth when the sons of God came to the daughters of men? Could you clarify who the sons of God and who the Nephilim are? I can. Let me say also that if you'd like a full explanation of this, our series on, uh, it's called The Saving Flood, The Saving Flood, a series on Genesis 6, 7, and 8. Uh, I've given a, a, at least one complete sermon on this uh, matter. But uh, let's just consider Genesis chapter 6, verses 1 through 4 for just a moment. It says, it came to pass when, the, when, when men began to multiply on the face of the earth and daughters were born to them. Now, this is, uh, Moses is saying, wait, uh, I've given you a genealogy up to this point in chapter 5, uh, the point of Noah, but now I want to go back for a moment and I want to flash back and see what happened when men began to multiply on the face of the earth. So as men began to have babies, men and women, of course, Adam and Eve, and it began to multiply then, and uh, there were daughters born to them. Back then, he says something happened, and what happened is in verse 2, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were fair, and they took them wives, all of which they chose. Now, I happen to think that uh, it's not unusual that young men think young ladies are pretty. Uh, this is, uh, you know, it came to pass, uh, the, you know, that as this happened, they began to notice. Uh, so no surprise here. It's been happening since uh, Adam and Eve when Adam discovered Eve was beautiful, bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. So here we have, I think in verse 2 is saying, Hey, red flag, something unusual is happening. So, uh, men began to multiply on the face of the earth. Daughters were born unto them. And the sons of God saw the daughters of men. that they were, they were fair. They were beautiful. And they took wives, each of whom they chose. Now, I think if you look at the, son, the term the sons of God, and you let uh, B'nai Elohim as the Hebrew. If you look up that term B'nai Elohim, and you let the Bible interpret itself, which you need to, you're going to find, though the phrase is not used often, that when it is used, it's used of angelic beings. So I think those who are arguing sons of God were good boys and daughters of men were bad girls. These were the boys from the right side of the track marrying the girls from the wrong side of the track. Now, uh, if, if so, this really is the foundation. Remember, this is the introduction to the story of Noah's flood. So you have to connect Noah's flood to Genesis 6, 1 and 2. If you don't, I think you've just totally messed up on, on the interpretation and Genesis 6, 1 and 2 become meaningless. So something's up here that I think it's saying you had now back then 
uh, angelic beings, sons of God. Now the question is, uh, were the question uh, is, were the Nephilim on the earth when the sons of God came? And I think the answer to that is no. The Nephilim are going to come about later. But you did have the sons of God on earth when this began to happen, and that is the angelic being. Now I think don't let sons of God confuse you, because you can see again as you uh, let the Bible interpret the Scripture that these could be the fallen angels, uh, those demons uh, as we would call them, those who fell with Lucifer or aligned with Lucifer. So here they are. They've been cast down to the earth and uh, they're working on Lucifer's uh, uh, behalf and they come together. Now, that's verse, uh, verse 2. Look what verse 3 then says. It says, And the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man. Now, again, connect those. Verse 3 comes after verse 2. Make them, make them connect. So, sons of God are coming together with the daughters of men, and God says, No more. I am drawing a line on the sand. This is too far. I don't see how you can come up with any interpretation that says, well, these are the children of Cain and these are the children of Seth or whatever. Uh, it may be, you know, the bad and the good. I just don't see how that leads into verse 3 where God says 120 years is all I give them. Not 120 years of life, but 120 years from that point. God says the clock is ticking. 120 years and I'll not strive with man anymore. And the flood, by the way, was 120 years later. Uh, and then he goes on to say, let me tell you why I'm giving this time limit. In verse 3, for that he, that is man, for that he also is flesh. Yet the days of his, uh, of his, uh, yet his days shall be 120 years. Now, he is flesh. Let me ask you a question. How long in the history of the world has mankind been flesh? How long? That's right. From day one. When God breathed into him life, he became a living being. He was flesh all the way right there. Now, I think that is saying what we've got here is an issue because now angelic beings are coming together with fleshly humans and they are procreating and they are creating what's going to be these Nephilim later. And God says, no, man, woman, humankind is, is flesh. It's supposed to be flesh. We cannot mutate this race uh, into uh, half God, half man, kind of, or half spirit, half, uh, half fleshly kind of being. So, interesting then that uh, in verse 4 then he says, there were giants in the earth on those days. That is, there were Nephilim is the word on the earth in those days. And also after that, when the sons of God came into the daughters of men. When the sons of God came into the daughters of men, the Nephilim were the result. Now, I think the Nephilim are this, this uh, uh, mixed, it's, it's a messed up DNA. And you say, this is too science fiction for me. But let me ask you, if you were the devil and uh, you heard Genesis chapter 3 verse 15, which says, uh, I am going to send uh, uh, one who will crush the serpent on the head. And that one who's going to do it is going to be the offspring of a woman. What you'd be saying is, how can I stop the offspring of a woman from being able to crush me on the head? Hmm, I got an idea. I'll pollute the race. There's no way that a half-demon, half-human type creature with that polluted DNA could ever become the redeemer, the savior of the world, the one who does me in. They work for me, after all, so this will be my strategy. It would make perfect sense, wouldn't it? I mean, what else, what, what, what else have you got? That's what you're going to do. And so this is what they begin to do. And it came about when the sons of God came to the daughters of men that there were giants on the earth. Nephilim were on the earth. Now, also interesting, if you jump down to verse 9, it's, it begins to speak in, about Noah in verse 8. And it says in verse 9, these are the generations of Noah. Noah was a just man and perfect in his generations. Now, what does that mean? Perfect in his generations. If you look at the Hebrew uh, closely on uh, that uh, particular verse, uh, what it means is that word for perfect is actually complete or whole. Uh, that is, it might be the word we would use for integrity. Something that has integrity has, uh, has the same all the way through. And so uh, you take uh, something that has integrated color and you cut it in half. If it's blue on the outside, it'll be blue on the inside. It's integrated. It has integrity to it all the way 
way through. And uh, it's not like those chocolate bunnies. Those have no integrity. You bite them off and they're hollow on the inside. That's not integrity, is it? Well, uh, here it says Noah was perfect in his generations. And that particular word generations uh, has to do with the, the flesh. In, in, uh, in his DNA. Here's a guy who had not been polluted and so God says, I'm going to destroy the polluted race. I'm going to save Noah and his family and we're going to start over because I've got a promise in Genesis chapter 3 verse 15 and I will fulfill that promise even if it means destroying all human life and all of the, uh, of the life of the land. I'll destroy it all, put eight of them on a ship, and start all over again. That's how important it is to God. And I think uh, nothing else really explains for what the text says in Genesis chapter 6, nor uh, for, the, uh, for, for the flood in general. So excellent uh, question that uh, you give to us. Uh, thank you, Lynn. I appreciate that. Uh, Tammy says in Luke 19, 13, the Lord says to occupy till he comes. What dispensation does, does this apply to now or the kingdom time? Great uh, uh, question again, Tammy. And again, that's Luke uh, chapter 19 and verse 13. He called his ten uh, servants, delivered them ten pounds, and said to them, uh, Occupy until I come. Uh, the word is, uh, uh, some of the translations have it, uh, do business. It's a, it's a very pragmatic word. In fact, the uh, Greek word is, uh, is uh, uh, I can't uh, pronounce it, pragma, pragmatumai. Uh, and, and so it is, uh, in a very pragmatic way, uh, you know, be here and do this till I come. Now the question is what dispensation does it apply to now or to the kingdom time? I think that it can't apply for now though there's some incidental application. I think that it applies to those Jesus whom Jesus was talking to and Jesus was talking to the Jewish nation and uh, he was telling them hey very pragmatically uh, occupy or do business until I come. And uh, even if the uh, temple is destroyed, as it would be in 70 AD, you occupy till I come. You keep on it. You, you, you keep going. You just roll up your sleeves and uh, figure it out. If they take you from your land, then uh, learn how to be a bank, baker and a jeweler, jeweler, whatever it is. Be pragmatic about this all the way until I come. So I think uh, uh, primarily it deals with not this dispensation, because this dispensation at that time hadn't even been revealed yet. It was a secret or a mystery that uh, hadn't been revealed. So uh, you, you can't take application from previous generations and put them to this generation. Now, is there a point in which we should be very pragmatic in our occupation here until he comes? Certainly. In fact, uh, Paul says somewhat close to the same thing in Second, uh, second, second Thessalonians when he says, uh, you know, uh, live a quiet life, do business with your hands. That, in a sense, is, hey, very very pragmatically, just go on, carry out this business. And yet, it doesn't have, as the King James does anyway, that occupy sense, that word that Paul gives uh, for, clearly for this dispensation is, hey, uh, live, live your life. Uh, live it, uh, you know, love your family, care for one another, do the best you can. When you fall down, pick it up again and make a living by your hands. Uh, no, no need for you to... Uh, uh, to uh, utterly change the world, what you've got to do is live a faithful life for Jesus Christ and tell others about uh, the gospel of Jesus Christ. That is your assignment or the assignment of the church. Uh, thank you for that uh, question here. I appreciate uh, that today. Uh, and uh, let's see, uh, make sure I don't miss any of your questions that uh, are coming through. Good. Uh, looks like uh, we have got those. And uh, I want to give uh, just one more. It's really a word of comment uh, that uh, Chris from Forney, Texas gives. Uh, and uh, he says, I'm convinced that when a church throws its hymnal books out the door, it's throwing away one of its most effective tools to teaching the lost and edifying believers. Now, uh, let's talk about the hymnal just a moment. Uh, the hymnal is not the Bible. Bible, no doubt about it. And uh, yet the hymnal, if you begin to look at it, I, I, it is so filled with theology. The hymns had one, two, three, four, uh, sometimes seven, eight, ten, twenty. A lot of them aren't even uh, usually published in a hymnal of these verses that told a theological or a doctrinal issue. They didn't always get it right. I've talked about some hymns that I think just messed up on it. And yet 
Uh, in the days of singing hymns, you, there was a repetition of that. And uh, it, it, uh, it, it came that people understood, I know not when the Lord may come at night or noonday fair, or if they'll walk the veil with him or meet him in the air. But I know whom I have believed, and I'm persuaded that he is able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day. A great song of assurance that we learned just because we sang it over and over and over and over again. And uh, we learned those things. Now, uh, when a church does get rid of that. I think it does communicate some things about the church. Uh, and one of the things is we don't want to be associated with the past. We're a little allergic to the past. We're a little scared of the past. We want to be uh, culturally revel relevant. We want to be new. I'm not sure really, by the way, there ever was a time that hymns were culturally relevant, maybe more so than today, but uh, I doubt it. Uh, for the most part, singing is not relevant in our uh, culture today. Very few places do you go where they just uh, say, hey, before we begin, let's, uh, let's all sing a song together. That's uh, almost uh, never happens. There's just a, uh, a few places you might uh, encounter that. So it's not culturally relevant. Uh, so I, I think that uh, when we get rid of the hymnal, we do need to seriously consider what we're doing. I'm not opposed to having a screen in the church and the words are up there. Sometimes it's easier for uh, uh, us to read, those of us who are uh, beginning to uh, not have 2020 vision anymore. But the hymnal really can be very valuable. You know what I wish is somebody would go through and edit the hymnal. Many of those are in... Uh, um, uh, in um, public domain and could be edited. In fact, I know Robbie Dean's church, the West Houston Bible Church, has gone through and changed lines in some hymnals. Uh, and uh, I think uh, one, one like that uh, is a, a valuable uh, issue. So thank you uh, for uh, that uh, word, uh, Chris. And thanks each one of you today for being with us on Ask the Theologian. Always uh, glad to meet with you here on these Tuesday afternoons and to have just a little bit of face-to-face. -face. I hope you'll join us again on Bible study tomorrow night, the book of Romans, Thursday night, uh, the book of Daniel. And uh, we're, uh, we've got some Sunday broadcasts as well, Re uh, Rethinking Church and 30 Things You Need to Know About the Ministry of Jesus. So much going on. And uh, check us out at randywhiteministries.org or dispensationalpublishing.com. Use that save 20, uh, save two zero uh, code for 20% off. And can I also encourage you to go to uh, JN jndarbyacademy.org jndarbyacademy.org we've got uh, a, a great program for third through the twelfth graders families looking for a new alternative in the education of their children check it out it's not too late to uh, enroll for the fall semester jndarbyacademy.org until next time I uh, very much look forward to seeing you. Randy at randywhiteministries.org is my email and appreciate your donations. You can text RWM to 77977 and uh, easily give us a donation on your phone or click the donate button on our website. Till next time, God bless you.